Alex here with part 69 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As with my previous videos, I'd like to take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero. If you haven't seen it yet, that's the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened. And that's because my excess parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight year long high conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. This specific video in the My Docket series coincidentally happens to have a whole lot of those ancillary filings. We're gonna be going over like eight, nine, maybe 10 of them. Most of them are very short, one page, two page documents, just letting people know in advance. Also, a little bit of a different approach here. The main document is an amended motion, which isn't a thing in Nevada. And so rather than just have this video dedicated to an amended motion where I really only changed one line, um, it would be a pretty boring, pretty short video. I'm going to go ahead and lump in the next document, which is my reply to my ex's opposition um, to set the school that our son's going to go to and to alter the, the timeshare schedule. All of that being said, I will glaze over very briefly that amended motion. I will point out the line that I changed and I just want to elaborate a little bit. The big problem with amending a motion is the way that the time limits work, the way that the uh, the deadline to file an opposition to the motion works and it creates all kinds of chaos. Other states might allow you to do this. They might have something in the rules of civil procedure. Nevada doesn't. So typically what I tell my viewers when they ask me, hey, what if I file a motion and then something new happens that would bolster that motion, I typically tell them to just file a second motion and just mention, hey, I filed the first one two weeks ago, but something new happened and here's what it is. Um, that way your opponent can respond to both of those consistent with the time limits as to when they were filed and served. And it's a lot less confusing and you're gonna get a lot less grief, I think, from the attorney than if you try and do it the way that I did it. And I'm not even sure if it backfired on me or anything like that. I suppose we'll uh, get to see um, as we go into the series, but nothing jumps out at me in my memory. So if, some, if, if it was brought up, it was probably very minor. I guess I could go a little bit into the mindset as to my reply, because my reply to opposition is going to be what I spend most of my time on in this video. And I talked a lot about the dismay that I had on reading my ex's opposition. Mainly, I was upset because I had gone so above and beyond to try and get this resolved without going to court. And then as soon as I read her opposition, she's trying to paint me out as a person who sneak attacked her by filing this motion completely out of the blue, a total shock. And um, I don't even know that it matters because it's not as if she was going to agree to it anyway. It's not as if she's saying, hey, if he would have talked to me, we could have worked this out on our own. She still didn't agree with me anyway. So we would have still ended up litigating anyway. Not to say that you shouldn't, um, you know, try to resolve something prior to filing a motion. That's a good habit to get into. And in fact, one of our districts does have a rule requiring that, and that's District 8, Clark County. And I do talk about that in the video um, requirement to attempt resolution, but that's, you know, neither here nor there. I wasn't in District 8. I did actually attempt resolution with her three times. I sent her all those emails. So, I mean, I can remember being really upset. I felt like, what's the point of trying so hard to work with somebody else, to communicate with their attorney, um, to put all the disclaimers that I put in the first email, especially because I just riddled it full of exclaimers or disclaimers so that I could just underline that I wasn't trying to pressure her, but that we had a time limit based on an agreement that we made based on a sign order entered by the court. And it just goes to show you why I did the videos, win at all costs, which goes over how attorneys use win at all cost tactics. And the uh, the other video, which is they will never say good things because they won't. It doesn't matter how hard you try. If it's going to litigation, they will never say good things. And those are the two hardest lessons I learned. I think at this point, we should really just get into it and take a look at what I have filed.
And here we have the amended motion to modify timeshare schedule and establish education. As I mentioned earlier in this video, I'm just going to skip to, oh, well, I should mention what this is mirroring. The motion to modify timeshare schedule and establish education is what this amended motion mirrors. Virtually identical to that other document that we already went over with one exception, and that is a citation to a case. It is down here. So here on page three, I apparently mentioned Mac v. Ashlock when I quoted when parents cannot agree on an important issue, they come to the court on equal footing. And what I meant to put, or maybe I just meant to elaborate, is that this was um, affirmed in Rivero v. Rivero, the 2009 landmark case in Nevada. That's the only difference that I can find in this amended motion. As with my previous videos, you can go down in the description below, click on the link, download it, and if you see something that I missed, something different, go ahead and post in the comments below and we can talk about it. But from what I have seen, this is the only piece of the document, this one line, this corrected citation um, that I changed. Now, I mentioned that in Nevada, the rules of civil procedure don't allow filing an amended motion. By the way, they do allow filing amended, well, you have to ask permission, but you can't amend a pleading. And if you want to learn the difference between a pleading and everything else in Nevada, you can watch my video, Pleadings. But this specific um, document can't really be amended in this manner. I'm not even sure that there was a point to it. I'm sure that the court, well, I'm not 100% sure. It's good to just get these things right the first time, guys. I'm pretty sure that the court would know where this quote comes from when parents cannot agree on an important subject, etc., etc. But I'm not 100% sure. And I'm not really sure what the best approach to this would be. Uh, you could either file another motion that's very short, one page, indicating that you're correcting it. Or I guess you could use what they, they call a corrected motion, but I don't know. I mean, that, something like that isn't really talked about in the rules. I've seen attorneys do it sometimes, and who knows how it implicates the deadlines. There's just no idea at all. Do you file a response to both? Do you get to um, start the time limit again from the corrected one? Who knows? This, this stuff isn't really talked about, and so it's very confusing, not just to the attorneys involved, but also to the judge. I'm going to go on to the next document. Here we have a certificate of personal service indicating that I personally served this amended motion upon my ex's attorney, which means I physically took the paperwork into her office and handed it to somebody who worked there. Here we have the reply to opposition to motion to modify timeshare schedule and establish education. This is what we're going to be spending most of our time on. First paragraph, we go straight into the summary. I identify myself as the petitioner. I, I, I indicate to the court that I am representing myself by stating that I am appearing a proper person. And I identify the document that I, well, wait a minute. Yeah, I do. I do identify the document that I am replying to right here. It's the respondent's opposition to motion. And I also um, help the court out with the specific date that my ex's attorney filed it. And this is typically the best practice, in my opinion. When you file an opposition or a reply, you should identify the document that you are opposing or replying to. And it helps to put the date that it was filed. So memorandum of points and authorities. No factual background this time. We're just going to address my ex's attorney's assertions. Timeshare modification. Let's see what I do here. So she's, she proposes a timeshare quite similar to mine with the exception of Wednesday exchanges happening at 3 p.m. instead of 3.30 p.m. and an extra sliver of time for my ex on Thursdays from 7.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. I contend that the extra sliver of time for her is unnecessary. It's just an extra exchange <clears throat> and he's gonna be at school anyway. So why bother? He's going to be at school from 7.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. Oh, wow. That's what she's asking for? That's just even more a name than I thought. So she's asking for a sliver of time, which is not even going to have him. He's going to be in school. It's just, it's, I know why she's doing this. It, she feels better having 60% of the timeshare. It makes her feel like she's more important, like she's the better parent. And this is something that we went through over and over again. It, it, she, she just did not want to be seen as an equal in any way, shape, or form if possible. She was really upset when I got joint physical custody. She was really upset when I got joint legal custody. And the last thing that she really had was that she, he lived with her 60% of the time. I actually remember she used to tell him that, um, remember, you live with me, not with your dad. You live with me, not with your dad. And she would justify it by saying that, she, that he's at her house more than he's at mine. And so he only lived with her. That's the way she would constantly drill it into his head. Of course, when the judge changed this, she lost that as well. Here we have as a compromise. I maintain the timeshare proposal outlined in the instant motion with, with the Wednesday exchange at three as she proposes. 
So then I attach another illustration. We'll take a look at it when we get to exhibit one. Reply to the joint decision. So we attempted a joint decision where with, okay, so we did attempt to work this out together. Ironically, rather than show the court the good faith efforts she's made, she relies on the claim that my efforts were not good enough, which is true. She's not really saying that I didn't even try. She's just saying that my efforts weren't good enough. And I mention here, as the case law in Nevada states, when we can agree, joint decisions occur. When we can't agree, we come before the court on equal footing. It's that simple. It's a matter of fact statement that I'm making. When we can agree, we do so. When we can't, you make the decision. That's the way the law works. Rather than put stacks of email and repetitive evidence before the court, I evidence what appeared the most relevant emails. So what I'm saying here is there were even more emails than just three that I could have showed a whole lot more, but I didn't bother to do that. They actually call that cumulative evidence and they don't like that. They just need enough evidence to, to, to prove your case. They don't need 15 different documents when three or four will do. She made no attempts at all to let me know what her intentions were, and it's true. Um, I have asked for ideas from her as far back as June 10th. I am even more dismayed that her first mention of any specific proposal, which is Roland D. Melton, has been disclosed upon the filing of her opposition. This is something that really irritated the judge, and it wasn't until the end of the hearing that he, he realized that he was being duped. It wasn't until the end of the hearing that he realized she had every opportunity to co coordinate with me, and that the first mention of any school was when the opposition was filed. So reply to Roland D. Melton versus Coral Academy of Science. Personal, personal relationships and distance. At Coral Academy, he'd be attending a school with friends he has made in person. Because Coral Academy is a charter school, there's more personal touch. Parents have to actively make an effort to be admitted and chosen, which implicitly places him in an environment of more actively involved parents and their children. Um, location, half a mile from the party's exchange point at Denny's, which is true, it's very close, as we already have to drive there anyway. Uh, let's see, proximity of offenders, um, her opposition, Exhibit 6, erroneously displays statistics for Coral Academy, middle and high, oh, so the offenders aren't even near the elementary school. Uh, okay, uh, let's see, so there's a different address, she didn't even use the right address. There's one offender in that address range. Now, now I'm even more annoyed than before, because I, originally I thought it was unfair for her to point out how many offenders live near the middle and high school. Now I'm finding out she didn't even get the right address. It's just, it's just when it all costs. I'm sure, I'm sure they were aware of it and did it anyway. They were probably hoping that I wouldn't notice or that I'd overlook it. Uh, discipline events. Uh, unfairly compares the entire Coral Academy grades K through 12 with Roland Elementary. Obviously, when middle and high school children are lumped into Coral, Ac Coral Academy's discipline statistics, there are going to be higher numbers, which is true. Coral Academy's elementary school is completely separate, and it's true. It's a totally separate campus in a completely different area of town and it is drug and violence free. Test scores. Comparative test scores between the proposed schools is lopsided. Roland Elementary only has grades K through five factored in, where Coral Academy has grades K through eight. Furthermore, the variance in test scores is negligible. I actually ended up finding an article um, that I would bring to the hearing later, and that's what I talked about last video. That's the article from the Washington Post, which makes uh, Coral Academy look like a great school because it's ranked number two in the state. For want of prosecution, he's already been enrolled in Coral Academy. I've already paid the fee towards his uniform and, uniform and books. By the way, if I didn't pay that on within the seven days, he would have been disqualified. So she's, by her stalling, she ended up forcing me to make a call at the last second. Reply to attorney fees. The law and Li Ming v. Li Ming are irrelevant. NRS 18.020 and 050 are relevant. 18.0102B, that's what I meant to say, not 18.020. 18.0102B is held in Rivero v. Rivero to determine when an award of attorney fees is appropriate in child custody matters. Um, she's the moving party and she bears the burden of proof. Her claim that it is unjust to require her to oppose the motion and bear the attorney fees and costs is insufficient on its face, which is true. In Rivero, none of that matters. In Rivero, the only thing that matters is that Number one, she prevailed, and number two, she showed that I filed it without a reasonable basis or with the intent to harass her. If she doesn't prove those two things, she doesn't get fees. Here's the case cited by Rivero. You guys can take a look at it if you'd like to. I also talk about this in the video, Defend Against Attorney Fees. Army needs to attend school. Had I not acted, he would be excluded from attending Coral Academy. We stand three months away from his education, and it takes a motion to disclose what her proposals are. I've given her reasonable notice and 
and that I was making efforts to enroll him. Hearing, I have witnesses and children, his friends who, who attend Coral Academy, that can appear and testify in support. I remind the court of the urgency of the matter as his education is to begin on August 9th, 2011. Affirmation. By the way, this is a great thing for you to do. If you're going to ask the court for a hearing, which is what you're going to need whenever you have, a, 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 what do they call it, a um, genuine issue of material fact, and we have a bunch of them, if you're going to ask for a hearing because of that, it's a good idea to tell the court what you're going to do at the hearing. It really does help, especially when you're representing yourself, because a lot of times the judges assume you don't know what you're doing. And even when you do know what you're doing, you still don't know as well as an attorney. But anyway, uh, one of the things that needs to happen at a hearing, an evidentiary hearing, is that witnesses need to come and testify. Yes, it can be just the parties. It's not that uncommon for it to just be the parties. But it's even better when you have other witnesses, like a teacher or a principal, stuff like that. Affirmation, which we've seen several times. It just indicates to the clerk of the court that I have reviewed the document and does not contain a social security number. Here's my declaration in support. This is the affidavit that's required under the court rules, and it just is a way of indicating to the court that everything I've stated, everything factual that I've stated in this document is under penalty of perjury. Certificate of mailing. Okay, so this is good. I, I did this a few times prior. I don't know why I don't keep doing it, but this is just a better way of attaching your, your certificate of mailing to the actual document you're filing rather than filing a separate certificate in the document, or sorry, in the docket. This kind of just takes care of it all in one. And this certificate of mailing indicates to the court that I mailed this document to my ex's attorney under Rule 5. So I didn't physically take this one and give it to her her staff. I, I just mailed, put it in an envelope, mailed it, and that was that. List of exhibits. We got a timeshare compromise, the offenders list, and emails. So these are all three we're going to go through really quickly. Exhibit 1. Here's the compromise, which is, let's see here, what is this? Oh, so these, okay, so this is her proposal. This is my proposal, which was 3.30 until midnight on Sunday. Hers was 3 p.m. with this gap of time that she just moved over a little bit. So she didn't want to lose this time. She just moved it over. And then my proposal is to go ahead and go with her 3 p.m. like she requested, but then to still close that gap. <coughs> Exhibit two. So this is the actual address, and it's just one offender. Exhibit three. Exhibit three is an email. Received your vacation, everything looks good. If you have any ideas about him going to preschool, kindergarten, etc. So this is just another email that I sent her that she didn't reply to. And another one. Uh, okay, really was just curious, didn't have anything I wanted you I wanted to force on you. So again, I keep communicating with her in this way that is just I put constant disclaimers in here because she reacts to everything with hostility. And so these two emails well this one for sure has a disclaimer. I'm not trying to force her to do anything. I don't know about the other one, but that's just two emails. Two more emails she didn't respond to. Here we have the request for submission. By the way, you guys, the rest of these documents should be those ancillary documents I talked about earlier in the video. They should be very short. The request for submission just indicates to the court that the motion, opposition, and reply on the education issue are now fully briefed and that they are now submitted to the court for a decision. If you want to know more about the request for submission, please watch the video, Request for Submission. There's a whole lot behind this piece of paper. It's more than what you think. And this is another certificate of mailing, just indicating that I mailed a request for submission to my ex on the 23rd of May. Well, my ex's attorney, not my ex directly. Here we have the application to release appeal bond. Okay, so sometimes I see documents referred to like this as an application instead of a motion. What I always assumed is that these are documents that didn't need to give your opportunity or your ex an opportunity to respond. They weren't adversarial. I wasn't trying to take something from them. And so they're not titled motions. I'm not really sure that this is the right thing to do. I've seen some help, uh, some self-help forms that were titled applications, like for example, application to proceed in form of papyrus. But this is, uh, I mean, I just probably assumed that my ex didn't really need to, you know, oppose or respond to this because I was just trying to get my appeal bond back. I wasn't trying to, to take anything from her. For anyone who doesn't remember, when I filed that notice of appeal, not the first one, but I think the second one. Yeah, the second one, I had to pay a, a $500 bond. And unless your ex can claim something on that bond, for example, if they have incurred costs in defending the appeal, you're supposed to get it back. That's not a filing fee. Those aren't costs. 
That's just money that the court holds on to for your ex just in case you lose the appeal and they incur costs in defending the appeal and they want to get some of their money back. So I'm indicating to the court here that on the 21st, I filed a notice of appeal and I posted a $500 bond that on the May, uh, May 10th, 2011, the Supreme Court of Nevada affirmed the decision. And I am arguing here that under Rule 7, the purpose of the bond is to cover costs to my ex and um, that in proper person appeals, the Supreme Court reviews a case before directing the opposing party to respond. In this appeal, the Supreme Court rendered a decision without my ex having to do anything. She didn't file any papers. She didn't incur any costs. Because no action was required of her and the district court's order was affirmed, the case, the case is closed and the, the appeal bond can be dispersed. So I'm asking for the appeal bond to be dispersed back to me. And, it, and this works eventually. In fact, let's take a look further down this um, because I think it actually is included in this list of documents. Here's a certificate of mailing where I mail this document to my ex's attorney. Here's my request for submission on the application to release the appeal bond. I'm going to look and see here if I actually waited. No, I didn't. I filed it immediately. So I immediately uh, submitted this to the court for a decision without giving my ex an opportunity to respond. In hindsight, I probably shouldn't have done that. I should have probably filed a motion because there's still a chance that she might have tried some way to claim that bond. Um, in this situation, she didn't. But it, I think some judges might get annoyed because somebody might actually want to try and claim that bond for some reason that we don't know of. And the judges don't always know what's going on up in the appellate court. So... Again, this didn't backfire on me, but it's just some advice, I guess you could say to my uh, viewers, is that if you're trying to get your, your bond back, you might want to give your opponent the time limit to respond, just like with any other motion that you file. Certificate of mailing indicating that I mailed this document to my ex's attorney as well. Notice of my ex's refusal to pay child support. Why did I file this? I'm appearing in proper person and I'm notifying the court of an intent to file a motion for contempt based on, let's see here. I allowed my ex to withhold child support while negotiations were ongoing in anticipation of a near zero child support conclusion. After conducting analysis with my ex's attorney, I notified my ex that child support should continue as negotiations were taking longer than expected. Um, either in spite of willful ignorance, she refused to pay child support. Okay, so yeah, this is me being nice and it backfired. So I told my ex that since my, you know, her attorney and I were trying to work out the new child support number, she could just hold on to child support for a while. And what happened is she started to stall and then she just refused to pay. And this is something I talk about in the video, exploiting good faith. With a high conflict ex, you don't want to be nice because they'll take your kindness and they'll weaponize it. They'll use it against you. And that's exactly what she did. From this point on, I learned my lesson and I stopped being nice. If you're nice to your ex and they just abuse you, if they just say, thanks for being nice, I'm going to take that nice thing you've done and hurt you now with that nice thing that you've done, um, just stop doing it. They're basically telling you anytime you're nice to me, I'm going to just hurt you with it. In fact, one of the things that my, my uh, second judge stated that I've never forgotten to this day was she looked right at my ex and you guys are going to see this when, it, when we get to the hearing video. Um, she looked right at my ex and she said, ma'am, you don't get to take his olive branch and beat him over the head with it. It's a saying that I've never forgotten to this day. Here's the affirmation indicating that this notice doesn't contain a social security number. Non-opposition to motion to review and modify child support. So let's see here. My ex filed a motion to modify. I remember this. Okay, so yes, earlier in the My Docket series, she did file a motion to modify child support. And here I am indicating to the court that I do not oppose a review. That doesn't mean that I am saying that she can have however much she wants in child support. I'm just saying that I don't oppose the court reviewing and setting a new amount. I'm still going to be taking place in arguing the specific amount of the child support. I think this non-opposition caught my ex's attorney off guard. I don't think she expected this. By the way, if anyone wants to know more about these, please take a look at my video, non-oppositions. Why am I even including this? Okay, the clerk of the court would have made me do it. This is not This is wrong. You're not supposed to put this... Okay. Sometimes the clerks of the court get confused and they think you're filing a motion or an opposition and you're not. It's like, hold on, this is a notice of non-opposition. It's, it's not anything that's adversarial. I'm actually just saying it's okay. Whatever you're asking for, you can have. So rather than argue with the court clerk or with their supervisor, all, most of the time, not just me, but pretty much anyone else would just say, okay, okay, fine. Let me get that piece of paper, fill it out, sign it, staple it to the document and just give it to them just so you can get your document filed and get out of there. <clears throat> certificate of service. So this is a certificate of service on the non-opposition and the notice of, refu of her refusal to pay child support and the request for submission. I just like to reiterate, I don't know why I filed that. 
notice of refusal to pay child support, notice of intent to file a motion. You don't. You could just send an email. You don't have to file something in the docket. The docket. You could send an email to their attorney. You could send an email to them saying, "I'm going to file this motion to hold you in contempt if you don't pay." Filing it in the docket is just going to create one extra piece of paper for everyone to look at, including the judge. I. I, I this is not something that I would do with the experience that I have now. And this is a certificate of service that's done by mailing. So I'm indicating that all these documents were placed into an envelope and mailed to my ex's attorney. Another request for submission. This time I am submitting to the court the motion for review for modification of child support and my non-opposition, as well as my ex's refusal to pay child support. Here we have an order directing parties to mediation. So the court has responded by sending us to mediation. This should be the last time we're sent to mediation. This should be the third time. I may have lost track somewhere along the series. If I did, I'm sorry, guys. Um, let me take a look at this order first, and then I'll mention how it went. Okay, so the court has reviewed my motion to modify the uh, schedule and set up uh, education for our son, my ex's opposition, my reply to our opposition, I submitted the motion on May 25th. The court notes that I filed an amended motion. However, the amended motion makes only minor changes to my initial motion. Therefore, the court will consider the merits of the party's filings at this time. The court now finds and orders as follows. The parties share only one minor child. Okay, so yeah, that's the next paragraph. He's summarizing the fact that we share one common child. Joint legal custody, joint physical custody, and our current schedule. Next assertion is that pursuant to the agreement, we were supposed to meet on or before the third week of May. Next assertion is that the court entered an order denying my request for sole decision-making power in relation to education. The court also urged us to take a parenting course. I appealed to the Nevada Supreme Court. Why is this even mentioned? Weird. Okay, next we have the motion to modify timeshare schedule. Um, I claim that I attempted to discuss with my ex the time schedule as, as directed by the July 2010 stip in order. However, I contend that these discussions were unsuccessful. I also claim that as, as of December 2010, I advised my ex of my intent to place him in the charter school lotteries. He claims that he attended the parents' orientation, but she did not. Next, I allege that I informed her on April 29th that I had one week to enroll him. Next, the court asserts that I requested the court order that he attend Coral Academy. I also requested parties' timeshare to be modified. In opposition, my ex claims that I enrolled him in Coral Academy without any input from her. She argues that I did not inform her and that I only informed her that I was going to an orientation for Montessori. She agrees to modification. She proposes a similar schedule. Regarding the school, she opposes sending him to Coral. She argues that there's a bunch of offenders reg uh, registered within 19 or within the, what is it? One mile, one half mile radius, there's 19 offenders registered. She argues that the school is local. Okay, so yeah, she's got it completely wrong. The school is not next to West Hills. She's completely wrong. Um, in my reply, I oppose her having the child. I, I oppose her timeshare. I claim that I have no problem taking the child to school on Thursdays. Regarding the school issue, I claim that in her opposition, it's the first time I've ever heard of her preference at all. I believe that Coral Academy is a better school because it's more personal touch. I controvert the offenders in the vicinity, and I controvert the statistics. Okay, I claim resolution of the matter is urgent, as a child's education is scheduled to begin on August 9th, 2011. Pursuant to Wallace, the court's decision regarding visitation is a custody determination. When modifying child custody, the court has to apply the best interest factors. Nevada law states that any order for joint custody can be modified or terminated upon petition, which is what we're doing. The court has the discretion to deny a motion without holding a hearing unless the moving party demonstrates adequate cause for holding such a hearing. This is called a Rooney v. Rooney standard. And there he is citing Rooney v. Rooney. Pursuant to the local rules, 44 subsection 4b contested motions shall be set for hearing. Regarding the school, the choice of the child's school is an issue of legal custody. Legal custody involves basic responsibilities. Joint legal custody requires that we be able to cooperate. And then he cites a statute stating that the family court shall, whenever practicable, encourage resolution through non-adversarial methods. After this, okay, so he's sending us to mediation here. After this, I learned how to use the same rules against him. So he's using rules to force me to go to mediation. Basically, he teaches me how to use the rules to force him to bypass mediation. There's a bunch of exceptions in those same rules. He's just glazing over them. He's not even mentioning them. He basically teaches me that rules is where the power is, and I start to use the rules to get out of mediation because it's pointless to go to mediation with her. 
Um, we agree that the timeshare should be modified. It appears that there's only a marginal dispute as to the appropriate timeshare. The court wants to send us to mediation under Rule 53. And the court schedules mediation on June 14th, 2011 at 1.30. The court's required to assess a fee, and it orders both of us to pay $150. To cancel a mediation appointment, you have to contact the family mediation office at least 48 hours prior. If you fail to do so, you for I'm assuming you forfeit the money. Oh, you're assessed a fee in addition to the fee that was assessed above. You, you, so you get penalized and you lose your money. It's for the order that the party shall bring with them to mediation the ground rules and information form provided to them with this order. I believe that the schools, that the child's school is urgent and must be resolved prior to August 9th. Therefore, in the event the parties are unsuccessful at mediation, after the mediation appointment, either of us can contact the administrative assistant and set a hearing on this matter. <clears throat> By the way, guys, uh, let me think. I do believe that I should have set, I should have filed a notice to set when I filed my motion. I shouldn't have waited until the court's order. Um, there's local rules that, uh, I think I talk about this in the video, notice to set. So I'm not even going to talk about it anymore. Please watch my video, notice to set, to know what I'm talking about right now. Here is the boilerplate penalty for violation of court order. This is the stuff that says you can't detain, conceal a child, or move a child from the custody of a parent. This is boilerplate language that's included in every single order entered by the family court. It's required by law for this to be put at the end of every single order. Certificate of mailing and... Um, this is indicating that the judge mailed this document to me at my address and apparently e-filed or e-served this to my ex's attorney. Here is the mediation information sheet. It just says what you're supposed to bring to mediation, where you're supposed to go, what you're supposed to do when you arrive. Here's the rules about mediation. These are interesting rules. I'm not going to read them, though, because I have a video that I already talk about this in. Please watch my video. Oh, what is it called? Settlement Negotiations Not Admissible. If you watch that video, you'll learn a lot about what this form is talking about with regards to confidentiality and participation in mediation and settlement. And that's basically this page as well. And then we got a questionnaire. This is like an application to fill out. Second page of the application. Okay, now we have an order rescheduling the mediation appointment. It's probably going to be a very short order. For some reason, the court had to reschedule it. So... The mediation was moved to July 5th. I wonder when it, where it was earlier. Ugh, I can't find it. Well, okay. Well, all we know is here's the date. It was scheduled for July 5th, 2011, which is going to give us barely a month to set a hearing. It's just awful that the court did this. This is why I should have filed it six months in advance. Um... And this is also why I should have complied with the rules on notice to set, and I should have filed the notice to set immediately, right when I filed the motion way back. I shouldn't have waited, but I didn't know. I didn't know that there were court rules that discussed how this process works, and so I just kind of wandered aimlessly, hoping that the court would help me along. Anyway, the court reschedules it for July 5th. It looks like they just re the court just reiterates the assessment fee, the what happens if you don't show, cancellation process. Uh, the rest of this language is all the same. And then here we have the court indicating that it mailed it to me. Okay, so there were, I think there was one, maybe two. No, there was just one. Yeah, there are two things I wanted to mention. So I mentioned that I filed that application for the, the bond to be refunded to me. My ex's attorney does not oppose that, and eventually it is refunded to me. We're going to get to talk about that when the actual order comes down from the court. But yes, that $500 bond that I posted with my $250 filing fee, total $750, $500 out of that $750 got refunded to me, and we will see that eventually. It's going to probably be up in the next video or maybe the video after that. And the mediation. Here's what I can remember about the mediation. My ex showed up with a bunch of binders. I vaguely remember it being like three or four. I think it was four. Each one was the thickness of a phone book. That's the one thing that I remember. She would not communicate to me no matter how many emails I sent her. I, I strongly believe now in hindsight she was stalling. She was hoping that I would not file anything. She, it was, this is what I've talked about before with, with these videos. I think I talked, I, the video is called Creating Emergencies, where I talk about this problem, where people get into this Cold War sort of, this, this sort of conflict where nobody's really filing anything in court, but both sides are trying to angle how they're going to sweep the rug out from, a, from under the other person and, and do something without the permission of the court and just do it, just like file or, you know, enroll their kids in a school. And um, that's what I suspect she was trying to angle for. 
And what was really frustrating was after her efforts to stall failed, all of a sudden she went from no communication, total radio silence, to filing an opposition characterizing me as a harasser, as somebody who didn't reach out to her, and having all of these opinions now about what school they should go to, and then showing up at the mediation with four phone book sized binders with all kinds of details about that school that she wanted them to get into. That's all I remember. She also launched character attacks, belittled me, um, basically was humiliating and insulting in front of the mediator. The one thing that I remember that the mediator said that I'll never forget is he looked right at her, or no, he looked right at me and he said, sir, just so you know, you don't have to put up with your character attacks. And I remember feeling a lot better when he said that. But I mean, what, what really can we do? He's not a judge. And um, ultimately the mediation failed. He submitted a letter to the court indicating to the court, please don't send them back here. This is not gonna work. And I can't wait till I get to that letter. We're gonna get to that in a couple of them. Um, um, I think in a couple of videos. He doesn't really blame either side. He just puts like a one or two line sentence saying the mediation failed and um, to not send us back. And I end up using that letter, you know, in the future to stay out of mediation. And I guess that's all I can really say at this point. So we should just move on. Going into the aftermath, I filed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten out of twelve of those documents, but they were all free filings, so I incurred zero dollars in costs. My ex's attorney didn't file any of those documents, so she incurred zero dollars in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred zero dollars in attorney fees. My ex's attorney would have probably spent one minute on that amended motion, one minute on that certificate of service. Um, the request for submission, a minute, uh, the application to re refund my bond, a minute, the other request, a minute, um, the other two notices, one of non-opposition and one of failure to pay child support. Well, for the non-opposition, I'm going to just say a minute, so we're up to six minutes so far. And I guess we can round that notice of failure to pay child support to four more minutes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, like she would have had to communicate with Max about that. Let's set that one aside for a second. Um, we got another request for submission. Let's just put that into one minute. The court's order sending me to mediation, uh, sending both of us to mediation. We have two of those. Um, those we can make into, I guess, combine those both at five minutes. So we're now at 12 minutes. I'm going to go ahead and round that notice of... Uh, not wanting to pay child support to three minutes, so we're gonna get to 15 minutes total right there. That's everything except the reply. And that's probably just gonna be like a really quick email to my ex. Hey, you're not paying child support. Anyway, we got 15 minutes so far, and then we've got that reply. The reply, I don't know. I mean, it, was, it wasn't it was very thorough, at least not compared to some of my other filings. There were a few emails. She might have wanted to talk to my ex. Let's just go ahead and call that 15 minutes for the entire reply, including the communication to my ex about what was in the reply. There were a few emails in there. Um, I pointed out that she had the wrong address with regards to the school. So there would have had to been a little bit of a discussion with my ex and her attorney, between my ex and her attorney. So another 15 minutes on top of the 15 minutes for all the other documents that takes us to 30 minutes. And at the rate of $250 an hour, that's going to bring my ex's attorney fees too. $125. As with my previous videos, if you have any questions, feel free to post them down in the comments below, and I will see you guys next time.